uh, acknowledgements, et cetera, which mm -hmm. allow you to start talking Great. in a few minutes and hopefully by then everyone will be on. Uh, my mm -hmm. name is Luke Whitington. I'm the Executive Officer of the Search Foundation and I'm your host for this event. Before we begin, please be aware that this briefing is being recorded so we can post it later to the Search Foundation YouTube channel. Also note that I'll post what I say here in what I'm saying now in the chat section so you don't have to worry if you have any hearing problems or you're busy getting your Zoom set up. I would like to begin by acknowledging, as we always do, that we're meeting here in Australia on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. The sovereignty of this land was never ceded. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and emerging of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, traditional owners all across the continent. I'm on Gundungurra and Darug land, where we say, Warami Gamarada, welcome comrades. I would also like to acknowledge two legends of the Australian Labor Movement, Tom and Audrey MacDonald, who are joining us today. Uh, today is Tom's 94th birthday, and I think I speak for all of us in wishing him many happy returns. Tom and Audrey are active members of SEARCH and continue, be, continue to be very active in the Labor Movement. Uh, and you should read their book, which is available at their website, which I will uh, link to in the chat section as well. We're, very, we're incredibly lucky to have John Quiggan with us on this Zoom call to talk about the corona crisis and what the priorities should be now and in the future. Uh, first, I'll tell everyone about the event and then give a 30 second intro to search and then a one minute introdu introduction to John. After those introductions, John will speak for around 25 minutes and then we will have questions, which I invite you to submit in writing in the chat section. We will wrap up on the hour. To enable us to run this efficiently, all participants will be muted unless called upon to ask a question. The chat section is limited to messages to me as the host, otherwise I won't be able to collect all the questions. However, if you would like to discuss what is being said, you can comment on the Facebook event page discussion board. Uh, I've posted that in a uh, link in the chat section. I'll do that again shortly. Um, you can also, of course, uh, have a discussion with John uh, at his uh, blog, johnquiggan.com, which I'll also link to and encourage everyone to sign up for the email alerts for that too. So a quick introduction to SEARCH. SEARCH is a democratic membership-based organisation that links and enables socialist activists across political parties, generations and movements all around Australia. We have members from diverse backgrounds and interests, but we have common aims and values summarised in our pursuit of democratic ecological socialism. We run socialist education programs, publish news and views on Facebook and at search.org.au, and we put on events like this one we're having today. So on to John. For many of you, John needs no introduction, but for those who don't know him, uh, John is professor at the University of Queensland and well-known commentator and author. He blogs at johnquiggan.com, where he provides, according to the header, commentary on Australian and world events from a socialist and democratic viewpoint. His long list of academic and popular works includes Zombie Economics, a devastating critique of the persistence of disproven neoliberal ideas, Great Expectations, Microeconomic micro Reform and Australia, and Taxing Times, a guide to the tax debate in Australia. He is both prolific and influential, as his research record shows. He's a fellow of the Economic, Econometric Society, the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, and many other learned societies and institutions. He's produced over 1,500 publications, including six books and over 250 journals, in fields including decision theory, environmental economics, production economics, and the theory of economic growth. He has also written on policy topics, including climate change, microeconomic reform, privatisation, employment policy, and the management of the Murray-Darling River system. His latest book, Economics in Two Lessons, Why Markets Work So Well and Why They Can Fail So Badly, was released in 2019 by Princeton University Press, and I'll link to that uh, book as well. He's been actively contributing to debate around what to do in response to COVID-19, and the topic today is, in relation to the pandemic, what now, what next? and what after. So we're delighted to have you online with us, John. Please tell us what in your view should be the priorities now, what they should be, should they be in the near future and what after the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, thanks, Luke. Thanks for inviting me. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the virus itself. Obviously, I'm not a, a specialist in epidemiology, but a lot of the modelling can be understood by anybody with the relevant skills. And so what that tells us, I think, is with current policies, we can expect to see a continued decline in the number of cases, a 
approaching eradication in the relatively near future in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that step is going to be a great deal further off in the rest of the world. So that in turn means that um, uh, uh, over the next few months, a uh, uh, deliberate but I think fairly rapid pace, we'll see a winding back of a wide range of the controls being put in place domestically, uh, but uh, a continuation of, of quarantine in national borders and of a wide a variety of social distancing measures. So that's the um, that's the framework on which I'm I'm going to assume things are going, and that's and obviously the analysis would be very different in a country where uh, the virus was was still endemic. So um, looking at responses so far, I have to say. Uh, both in terms of the response to the pandemic and in terms of economic policy, uh, Australian governments have done surprisingly well. Uh, I found the communication to be pretty confusing, but the actual actual policies have, I think, been uh, generally speaking the right ones with uh, some qualifications I'll, I'll make and introduced uh, with only a relatively short lag after, I guess, um, people like me were advocating them. So, so it's certainly been uh, one of the rare occasions in my entire career where I've regularly had the experience of writing uh, the government ought to do X and two or three days later the government in there does X. I tried saying announce their conversion to socialism and that didn't work but um, are some steps in that direction are nonetheless, uh, are nonetheless present. So, so we've seen first the very substantial increase in a job start replaced by job seeker uh, along with uh, as far as I can tell effective abandonment of most of the work search requirements which were being uh, imposed and this has gone on top of of course the uh, complete failure of the robo debt program and, and that, that money being a lot of money being returned to people who'd had money taken off them under that program so so a huge amount of progress there uh, job keeper uh, as a very short-term measure the wage subsidy to to employers to keep the existing employees uh, was a reasonable response i'll argue uh, shortly that, that needs to be uh, needs to be modified over time, and we've seen uh, seen a series of ad hoc measures uh, looking at particular industries. So uh, those are those are all uh, relatively positive steps. I think um, looking at the very immediate future, the, the first big issue that's going to come up is the uh, likely failure of the airline industry, and that includes not just Virgin but um, uh, Swissport, uh, the ground services uh, firm. Uh, on this issue. The government has lasted longer on wishful thinking than I think um, uh, they should have. It was perfectly reasonable, I think, to uh, uh, to ask the foreign buyer, foreign owners to step up, but highly unlikely they would have, uh, right in that sense to allow the firm to go into administration. Uh, but the idea that, uh, as people, I guess, taking the government fee, have been suggesting that it can trade its way out of difficulty, uh, it's just nonsense. They, they point to examples like US Airlines, in past years, like Channel 10, and say, well, if Channel 10 weren't allowed to broadcast, the chance that it would um, trade its way out of difficulties is very small. So, so I think there's no chance of rescuing ANZ other than by a public takeover. Of course, the foreign shareholders should get nothing, and the uh, the bondholders should take uh, take whatever deal the government's willing to give them. Uh, but uh, we should be protecting the interests of Australian workers and Australian travellers. Uh, that can't be done. That can't be done. Uh, by hoping that some private equity firm is suddenly going to come up with billions of dollars, uh, of which, uh, in the hope that, um, in the hope that, uh, a domestic travel will be resumed in a more or less in unlimited scale in the near future. So, and I think that's not going to be that's unlikely to be the only case. We're obviously are going to see, um, uh, as I've said, we we won't see resumption of international travel for a very long time. That implies a lot of bankruptcies going on where, where we're going to need, I think, uh, a systematic program of buying up failing companies and reorganising them under public ownership. Uh, some of those things will stay in public ownership, some of them but return to the private sector at a certain point. Uh, as I say, the government, compared to its past, has been, um, has been remarkably willing to, to, over, to throw uh, dog them out the window, and that in turn reflects the fact that over the 10 years or so since the global financial crisis, uh, the intellectual hold of that dogma has actually been declining. Uh, Morrison isn't anything like the ideologue that, say, John Howard was, uh, uh, while he thought that getting back in the black tested well in the focus groups, he was keen on it, 
uh, but he doesn't have any any real commitment to to these things. And most of the younger members of of the uh, coalition are the same to the extent they care about anything. It's cultural type issues like equal marriage and so forth. So so we're in a situation I think where uh, the policy debate uh, is very fluid. Is going to remain fluid. Now, um, what we're seeing now as we uh, will see, I think, the need to just push these particular issues uh, as they arise for the next few months, uh, the real issue is going to arise as, as we start to emerge from the, uh, from the major stage of lockdown, as we get back to the point where uh, most retail businesses, restaurants and so forth can, can reopen, uh, we'll still be in a situation, importantly, where large parts of the economy are shut down. The, as I've mentioned, international tourism, but also uh, because uh, things are going to get very badly in large parts of the world, uh, significant parts of our export industry are going to face uh, going to face a downturn. So the idea that um, the idea that we can snap back to pre-crisis normal, I think, uh, is 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 illusory, and that's important because it means that uh, that the government will have great difficulty, for example, in winding back JobKeeper while lots of people who can't be stigmatised as old badges and so forth uh, are still out of work, indeed, are probably still losing jobs. So uh, we're already seeing, I think, the debate being framed, debate about what to do, being framed in terms of calls for reform. We saw that from the Reserve Bank Governor, Phil Lowe, uh, and from Morrison himself. Uh, and this is more or less a ritual. Uh, for the last 30 years, ever, ever since the rise of neoliberalism, uh, market liberalism, economic rationalism, whatever name you choose to give it, under the Hawke and Keating government, whenever uh, a politician can't think of anything much to say, they say we need reform. Uh, clearly, indeed, I was, uh, I was struck by two features of, of responses. Uh, Phil Lowe sort of having said reform could only drag up a few isolated bits of the old 80s and 90s agenda, like uh, land tax, for example, replacing stamp duties with land tax, so reform which I and all economists think would be a great idea, but which runs headlong into the resistance of the greater Aussie homeowner, and maybe congestion pricing for cities, which isn't a too much of a problem right at the moment. There's really nothing left of that agenda uh, that, that it is right to go. The industrial relations part of the agenda, and indeed many other parts, have the obvious feature that Precisely, the reforms that were the changes that were introduced in the name of reform have made dealing with the COVID virus pandemic more difficult. Uh, we've had a long shift towards casualisation, towards uh, removing job security, and so forth. All of those things have made the task of preventing a catastrophic downturn in employment more difficult. The treatment of casuals was the big um, uh, was the big problem. If we had had permanent part-time work instead of casualisation. Uh, we would have been able much more easily to work out who was eligible for job keeper and who wasn't things of that kind similarly of course uh, nearly all the measures yeah things like um trade liberalization uh, uh, uh financial deregulation all of these things yeah, the shift in superannuation from defined benefit to accumulation funds all of these things have created difficulties uh, in the process of responding to the uh responding to the crisis rather than uh, making making it easier for the economy to handle them. And surprisingly, I was surprised to see Morrison himself, in fact, say, look, we have to have reform. Well, of course, he has to say that, but I just don't want the same tired old stuff you've been wheeling up for the last 10 years. And if you look at the record, of course, of the, of the LNP government, that's unsurprising. They haven't done anything that could be called reform on a substantial scale in the last seven years, other than stuff like bashing unions and giving tax cuts to their own supporters. So, uh, again, uh, although people may ritualistically nod in the relation in the direction of reform, I doubt that Morrison is going to be able to uh, use the use the crisis as an excuse for bashing unions. The union movement, having performed very well and cooperatively with the government in the crisis, is is in a strong position, I think, to resist those kinds of attacks. So I think uh, there's a clear recognition we have to do something and do something differently and that what's left of the 1980s or 90s manifesto of deregulation, privatisation and so forth uh, is not going to cut. We indeed pretty clearly are going to need more regulation, that's where we are, lots more regulation, uh, lots more effective public ownership by one means or another, uh, uh, so that I think uh, although it's unsurprising that we're seeing this push, uh, it's unlikely to proceed. A further point which is important is that 
the people pushing the most insane ideas in response to the crisis in direct opposition to the government uh, have been the leading advocates of far-right reform. The IPA, Centre for Independent Studies, uh, most of the large groups of columnists on the, on the Australian and the Murdoch press, all these people have basically said, well, looking at the pace of for me, you guys are all expendable. Yeah, we'll just let you die and, um, and uh, get the under 60s back to work. And, um, and, uh, that's, um, and that will help things. I mean, that's crazy from an economic point of view, but also I think uh, politically uh, is a club with which they can be beaten for a very long time to come. So, um, so I think in that sense, the opportunity for a favorable push uh, out of this is, is um, it surprised me great. Where do those things go? Well, uh, um, obviously we're at an incredibly good starting point compared to anything we could have imagined uh, with the uh, with the job seeker allowance. We have a benefit which is uh, after years, after decades of urging the end of the freeze and unemployment benefits, we've had it doubled. Uh, even if we're forced to wind that back a bit, the uh, uh, keeping it at a level, for example, comparable to the old age pension, is an important demand. In my view, uh, uh, a push for a guaranteed minimum income, that is an essentially unconditional income to everybody without a market income, equal to old age pension, uh, is, uh, is the right way to go. I don't think this is the right time to push for a universal payment to everybody, including the well-off, pull back through the tax system. We're no closer to that than we were before, and it remains essentially in Neverland. I have disagreements with some of my friends on the left about this. We are now incredibly close to a guaranteed minimum income in a way that we thought wasn't possible. Other countries like Spain are already announcing this. Uh, this, in my view, is the correct political strategy on uh, income maintenance. At the same time, and uh, consistent with what I've been arguing for a long time, uh, we need the government to take responsibility for full employment, responsibility that was officially abandoned in the 1990s, before that full employment was an official target of government policy. After that, macroeconomic management was handed over to the Reserve Bank, which while it includes that in its list of objectives, has maintained a focus on inflation targeting. So we need, need the government has accepted responsibility for creating large amounts of unemployment necessarily. It has to keep responsibility for putting people back to work. We can't go back to normal. I, I, I won't go into why I think, how I think monetary policy needs to be changed, but clearly that's been a complete failure and needs to be the whole relationship between fiscal and monetary policy needs to be returned in its basic elements to the post-war settlement where uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy work together with a full employment as the central objective. I'll talk more about that if people want the details, but I think the, the crucial political point of view is uh, we can no longer accept, well, unemployment is part of the way uh, the economy works. Uh, we can no longer accept any, any of this phrasing which places the economy, uh, a reified concept ahead of the actual needs of, of people. Uh, so that's, um, uh, that's, uh, I, that's uh, where we need to go. I think um, uh, th those are the initial demands. I think very clearly we're going to come out of, yeah, we, we're going to obviously come out of the, uh, this with uh, a very large budget deficit and a greatly expanded debt. Uh, as I've argued, uh, a large volume of public debt isn't a big problem in an environment where our interest rates are nearly zero. Uh, we can, looking at the experience after after World War II, uh, where the huge wartime debt uh, was gradually whittled down to effectively nothing through a combination of real output growth and moderate inflation. Uh, it's like if we could get the yeah, growth of nominal output, you know, real growth plus inflation up to 7%, our debt ratio would fall by half in 10 years, in, in, by a quarter in, in 20 years, and, and we could get past this at the same time, in fact, taking on more debt to finance new public investment. Uh, so that's, um, uh, that's uh, a, um, yeah, those, those are, are core elements, I think. Uh, and, uh, but it's important to realise that assuming we do get, get back to full employment, we can't, as, as some optimistic interpreters of things like monetary, uh, modern monetary theory imagine, uh, continue to just spend money without taxation. We have to, have to have enough tax to keep the rate of inflation under control. An obvious demand which needs to be brought forward relatively soon is to defer the legislative tax cuts of the future, the company tax cuts coming in next year, and even more the tax cuts for upper income earners scheduled for four years' time. I think uh, not 
precise the time to raise that now, but I see Anthony Albanese uh, having said, having waived those tax cuts through the parliament uh, on the basis of some very bad political advice is now correctly saying, legislating far in advance of, is a really dumb idea, something which Paul Keating warned of tourists with the tax cuts in 1993, which ended up with a great deal of egg on his face. So those will be, uh, those will be issues for the future. Uh, how much we can get, obviously it's a political struggle, but, but I think we're in a strong position to bring a guaranteed minimum income version of universal basic income, a demand for full employment, and a reconstruction of the energy economy uh, along renewable lines. Uh, those would be the three biggest issues that I'll be looking at as we, as we restructure the economy to something radically different coming out of, coming out of this crisis. Of course, at some point, presumably when a vaccine is developed, uh, we'll return, you know, conditions will return to something like normal, but by then I think for good or ill, the economy will have radically changed. Uh, so that's about my 20 minutes. I suppose I'll, I'll stop there and um, invite questions. Um. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, it was always a bit funny on uh, Zoom that people can't give you a, a round of applause, although the, <laughs> the reactions button down the bottom if people would like to, <laughs> to do that. Um, but we have a, a very good question first up from Kayla. Um, I'll unmute her and she can ask it herself. Okay. Um, hi, and uh, thank you for your speech. Um, I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on the powers that have been given to the police um, under COVID-19 emergency powers? Um, and if you think there should be more um, independent oversight, um, including investigation powers um, of the police during and after COVID-19? Um, sure. Well, I'm hoping, I mean, I think obviously in some sense, we'll make it up as we go along. I don't think the policies were, were, were terrible policies, but obviously when you give a fairly vague directive to a police force of thousands of people, some of them are going to exercise those powers sensibly, uh, some of them aren't, and we've seen, that, uh, uh, we've seen that in a number of cases, of course. I would hope that most of those restrictions will be relaxed fairly early in the piece. That, um, and it's important, of course, to then make sure to uh, uh, first that, uh, that unnecessary police powers, move on powers and so forth, uh, round back straight away. And that uh, if something like this tracking app goes ahead, that we, uh, as has been promised, uh, absolutely uh, keep police from using that. That's one of the, that was promised by the Attorney General, but, but we know what promises are worth. So that's an area where uh, if, this, if this proposal goes ahead, uh, which remains, I think, a bit unclear, uh, where we'll need to exercise very, very strong vigilance. But I would certainly hope uh, that that uh, the kind of restrictions that say you can't sit in a park bench by yourself uh, will be gone within a matter of weeks, and that um, uh, I think it's quite likely in the end that it'll be found that most of the fines that have been issued weren't really within the powers of the of the police under emergency powers in any case. But uh, we'll see how that goes. But certainly, I think uh, we shouldn't be willing to give up our civil liberties for this. People in general have have complied very well with with the. Uh, uh, with the rules as they understand them. I think we've seen a lot of cases where innocent misunderstandings have led, uh, combined with overzealous interpretation, have led to, uh, uh, led to bad enforcement decisions, but I hope that we can, we can get past that fairly fast. Thanks for that. I've got another uh, next question from uh, George Simon around uh, Virgin Airlines. Hi, John. Uh, thanks yeah. for that great um, presentation. Um, I've just been interested to watch over the last couple of weeks, the Labor movement has been doing a lot of campaigning around a Virgin bailout. Yeah. Um, I think rightly so, with 16,000 jobs mm -hmm. on the line. Um, of course, one of the key tenets of the argument the Labor movement has been running is around competition and what would happen to competition in the airline industry. And I think for mm -hmm. a lot of people on the left, that's... Um, that kind of sits uncomfortably with us. Um, and I'm just interested in your views really about um, whether you think there should be a bailout Virgin, the bailout package for Virgin, and if that were to happen, what, what that would look like and how sure. that would be done. Well, first on competition, I think, I mean, I'm obviously not a rabid enthusiast for competition, but private monopoly is the worst of all worlds. Um, so, and since, unless we, yeah, since we, don't be, uh, aren't, it's unlikely that Qantas will suffer enough for us to nationalise Qantas. Uh, that's, that's, I think, in terms of the market outcome, the worst one we could possibly have. Uh, 
so um, uh, so in my view, uh, ideally, if you know, I, we, I, we could make it various cases, but I think the uh, optimal of the feasible solutions, the optimal one for the labour movement is a public-private duopoly, essentially the two airlines policy, but without the parallel schedules and, and so forth, which were all introduced, in fact, to protect ANZET um, uh, from the effective competition of, of the then, then what was then TAA. Uh, so my view is, sure, I mean, we shouldn't be uh, fetishising competition. It hasn't delivered the goods in many respects, but uh, still two private firms or one public and one private are a lot better than uh, than a monopoly, and particularly a monopoly run by Alan Joyce. Thank you for that. Um, I've got a question here from uh, Wayne, who is sitting with Katija, um, one of many people who are uh, new multiples online. Uh, so you've got the floor there, Katija. Um, okay. Um... I'm, he's not with me, he's in the room there. Oh, I see, sorry, I can't find That's him. That's okay. We'll you can ask his question for him. Yeah, I'll ask it for him. Okay, for Wayne, um, uh, where is it? Oh, the far right have provided clear advocacy publicly with the IPA. Mm. Uh, how do we get the progressive viewpoint more into the public consciousness? Well, on the whole, I have to say, the more we hear from the IPA uh, on this, the better. I think they are utterly discrediting themselves in the eyes of, of the vast majority of the public. Um, and the louder they call for, uh, the louder they oppose the government's restrictions, uh, uh, the better it will be, I think. Uh, uh, coming, to, yeah, slightly more seriously, obviously. Yeah, so I think in this context, the strategy which GetUp has pursued and which others have, not to say, on the immediate response to the crisis, here's the distinct left position, but uh, back in the government and saying, yes, we need lockdown, yes, we need to protect all workers, uh, stick with this, uh, don't relax either, don't relax the lockdown too soon and don't remove the measures, uh, such as um, JobKeeper and JobSeeker, until we're fully recovered, is, a, is an effective strategy, I think, which um, uh, obviously is time limited. Once they start coming out with the reform agenda, uh, talk, there will, doubt, there will doubtless be stuff we have to fight over and resist. Uh, but for the moment, I think the more we can paint the IPA as the extremist fringe they are, uh, the more that people like uh, you know, Andrew Bolt reveal themselves as advocates of mass murder, uh, the better it is. Thank you. Thanks for that. And if people can uh, re-mute themselves after the, they've um, had their question, that'd be great. After they, uh, okay, no worries, Luke. From from John, <laughs> thank you, uh, Up next is an economist colleague of yours, uh, Shirley Jackson. Shoot, Shirley. Hey. Um, G'day, John, um, and thanks, Luke. Um, thanks for organising this fantastic uh, presentation. Um, I just wanted to um, ask you, John, if you've um, read much or what your opinion is on the community wealth building model which has been proposed uh, in the UK and the US, most notably in Preston and Cleveland, particularly as um, a potential, maybe not alternative, but um, supplementary um, strategy that we can be using alongside nationalisation, which, as we know at the moment, the current government's probably less likely to be um, pushing very hard towards nationalisation and uh, getting equity in the in the private um, firms. And uh, should we be pursuing more democratic forms of ownership through co-ops and the like? Um, so, I mean, I think there's there's room, room for those things. I think there are, though, a lot of limits to it in general, and particularly in a country like Australia, where the vast majority of us live in, in big cities, so that um, a notion of local community really doesn't stand up very well when you when you uh, when you point out that, that the average person uh, lives in one place, lives with people who live in one place, works with people who live in a very different place, socialises with people who live yet in other places, and obviously um, uh, yeah, that spans. Yeah, typical cities of millions of people. So that, so that I think those notions uh, are much more applicable to places where there's um, where where small towns uh, and you know, and uh, places where where yeah, physical community encompasses 
uh, living, working and socialising with, with much the same group of people. Uh, if we look at the advocacy of UBI though, I think there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of room, in my view, in concepts like participation income for small scale initiatives of all kinds. That's, that's I suppose what I see as the crucial benefit of that is to say, people can, we, before we move to the ultra vision of unconditional income for everybody, a participation income where people receive a living income provided they're doing something useful to the community, whether that's bringing up our kids, uh, engaged in study, volunteering, doing creative work, I think that would meet many of the goals of, that people see in these community-based movements uh, without, uh, without the requirement to create essentially artificial, uh, artificial boundaries within which these things are, are supposed to work. Thank you. I've got a question now from Lenore Hankinson around um, universal childcare. Lenore, take it away. Um, thanks very much, John, for this afternoon. Um, much appreciated. Um, so it seems like in a pandemic, we're all socialists now. You know, um, mm. private hospitals now being uh, private, uh, pub, you know, now being available to the public. And also, I was very interested in the move to universal childcare. Do you think that's going to mean um, such a great uh, productivity boost that they will keep it after the pandemic? I think all of these things are going to all these things are going to require uh, political struggle. I mean, I think even something uh, uh, something like um, uh, remote working has the potential to greatly empower workers. It has it always has the potential to be used in bad ways. Uh, but the you know, the uh, if you look at a great deal of resistance to it is from the desire of lazy bosses to be able to have people physically under their eyes uh, at all times. And um, and so I think. Uh, on these issues, uh, what we'll see is, I think, uh, a, a lot of the kind of resistance which says, look, this is impossible, it can never work, will be dissipated by the fact that, uh, well, we've done it and it has worked. Uh, on the other hand, we're going to be struggling over scarce resources, uh, and so we, we, you know, I think we need to push these demands as hard as we can uh, as, the, um, as we emerge from the crisis. So I think we will see benefits from it, uh, and and we need to just make that case as hard as we can. Right. Thanks for that. Mm. Oh, I can't hear you. I've got a question now from Richard Walsham. Thanks for that question. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Luke. Um, there's been some rhetoric coming from Frydenberg and Shadow Treasurer Chalmers about how we will be paying back debt for many years ahead, presenting this as a huge obstacle to uh, implementing progressive policies and I'm sure that they will be grasping the opportunity to use it both in the, the right in the Labor Party and the coalition to push back against progressive initiatives. How do you think we should respond to this? Well I think the first thing is I mean obviously the debt and deficits talk I think uh, I don't think will work nearly as well as it has in the past. I mean this is maybe the fourth or fifth occasion when the government has said, a government of one political persuasion or the other has announced, uh, we'll be back in the black anytime soon. Indeed, it was announced very prematurely here last May that this financial year would be, uh, we were already back in the black. So I think this kind of talk, I think, uh, has lost a lot of its political resonance. It was still working, I think, certainly in Queensland with Clive Palmer's campaign at the last election. And similarly, I think terrifying talk about debt uh, is not going to have the, um, not going to have the political purchase that it did. So I think that, I think that um, uh, the party that breaks with it will have a big, big political advantage. I, I think, um, I don't think in particular, you know, uh, if Labor tries to find people among its own supporters who say, yes, that's great, let's cut back all everything we're doing so we can pay down debt. I don't think I don't think that will work. So, if the right indeed lives up to its reputation as hardheads, uh, they will look at the polling numbers and say this is an absolute dog of an idea. Uh, let's not worry so much about the debt. As I've said, uh, we came out of World War Two with uh, a massive debt. Uh, Curtin and Chifley certainly didn't talk about well. Now that we've had the war, we really have to stop doing all the things we plan to do with uh, creating, expanding the welfare state. Pharmaceutical benefits and so forth. What we have to do is pay down debt. Uh, they went right ahead and did those things, and growth in the economy 
or reduced that level. And of course, uh, even after this, by the by, international standards, um, our public debt will be uh, our public debt will be incredibly low, uh, well below what the European Union was hoping to get before the crisis came. So, I think that this is a fight which we can and sh uh, we should be able to win, uh, which we can win. In that vein, uh, I have a question now from young Shan Turnbull. Uh, over to you, Shan. I was wondering if the public concern over deficit debt and taxes can be reduced or eliminated by the government, not the Reserve Bank, trading money in the old-fashioned form of self-liquidating stamp script. And, it, and that way you create no debt and you can helicopter it straight into the MyGov accounts to remove the, uh, reduce the size of the deficit, debt, taxes and inflation because it's self-liquidating money. It pays for itself as it, and it was used widely in Europe and uh, USA in the Great Depression. And that's where you could get your universal basic income straight away and be much more generous in rebuilding the economy. So what do you think about using digitized stem script to avoid debt and de deficits? So generally, I think about things in terms of the real economy. I mean, that's, um, I, you know, uh, I don't pay much attention to, uh, to monetary arguments of all kinds. Uh, the issue, I think, with the, um, yeah, the issue, I think, with the, uh, with, the, with the current measures and the UBI is uh, what's happening to the real resource in the economy. So I just run through what's happening right now is Lots of people who were producing stuff, you know, people who worked at restaurants, in retail stores, they aren't producing stuff. They so you can't. wouldn't consider self-liquidating money? Uh, let, well, I, as I say, let me give my, I, yeah, I, I don't, generally speaking, as I say, I, I'll give the answer in real terms and then, then, then come back to the monetary aspect of it. So what, what we've done is give lots of money to those people in the form of JobKeeper and, and, uh, and JobSeeker, uh, which means that although they're not, Create, although they're not producing anything, they're consuming uh, food and groceries and all the things that uh, we do. How is that possible? The answer is everybody else is engaged in more or less forced savings. So people who are in work aren't spending as much. And a good thing too, because if, if, if they all were, if we all were, those of us who are in work, we're spending as we did, consuming the same resources we did, while at the same time the people who are out of work were doing this and real output was reduced, uh, that simply wouldn't add up. So, so we need, uh, in that sense, uh, in that sense, coming back to your point, uh, in this kind of circumstance, the government can create money by whatever device it chooses to, whether it calls it debt or self liquidating script or whatever, uh, and the real economy works. But if we return to full employment in due course, uh, we have to still meet the constraint that what we produce is what we can choose. There's no way that any monetary scheme can get around the fact that if we want to consume a million restaurant meals every week, we have to produce a million restaurant meals every week and the same for the, the whole of the economy. And that's going to be even more true with uh, the decline in world trade, which is certainly going to continue for a very long time. Uh, so in those circumstances, the issue of money uh, is constrained essentially by uh, the fact that um, we need to maintain a monetary issue to achieve a desired rate of inflation, which in my view ought to be four or five percent, we then need fiscal policy to keep real activity uh, at full employment. So I hope that uh, that's my answer anyway. So you wouldn't accept uh, self-liquidating money to? Uh, in I, I, I guess I, don't, I just don't think it. I don't think any monetary scheme ultimately makes a great deal of difference. Have you uh, looked at it? Well, I'm saying I, I look at the. Re I'm saying I no, I don't. I look at the real economy. Well, this is the real economy back in the Great Depression. That's how uh, it got out of it in many communities. So when I, say, yeah, when I say real, I mean goods and services. I look at good services labour, as yeah, Marx did, for example, and just see money as something which is there to facilitate the flow of things. Thanks for that, Shan. We've got a lot of questions coming through. And as I said, we can discuss um, anything that's been raised today at the uh, Search Facebook event page for this event but um, John is no ivory tower academic he runs his blog johnquiggan.com and uh, his interaction is wonderful everyone should sign up for it I'll post the link 
again in the chat mm. towards the end of this discussion, but you can um, talk to uh, raise any of these questions with you. Can. On and lots of discussion of monetary issues there. Uh, comes up lots of people are interested in. Huge amount, MMT, Sanskrit, yeah. all that sort of stuff. So, but just for today, we want to get um, give everyone a, a bit of a turn and we're, we're rattling through it. It's really great. Um, the next question I had was from Don Sutherland uh, and I'll let him ask that himself. Uh, good, thank you very much, Luke. And thanks very much, John, for that overview. overview. And I agree with Luke that your blog is very revealing and uh, I hope other people who haven't yet signed up do so. Um, my question actually starts from a very serious concern with your assessment of um, what is being planned around snapback or wind back, mm. whatever it's going to be, that Morrison is working out with the Business Council and the AIG. I think you've underestimated that, but um, uh, perhaps there's another debate at another time. But it leads into my questions, which is firstly a sort of procedural one. Does everyone know about the United Workers' Union Workers' Plan to survive COVID-19? That's sort of a practical question. And then secondly, assuming, John, that you have looked at it, uh, what is your assessment of that plan as it currently stands? And I can explain that a bit further, further if I have to. Uh, so I have looked at it, but I have to admit I'm not on top of it right at this this moment. So I think, uh, I suppose I'll make... Well, I, I think we all need to be. Okay. No, well, I think, I suppose I'll make the more general point. I think um, it's uh, about snapback and all, all these things that... Uh, it's very difficult to predict what the situation will be uh, by the time these issues come to be relevant. I think in terms of the government's position, you know, I'll just mention it's five or six weeks ago, they were floating with all their usual sources in the, in the press uh, saying, we'll never do what Rudd did. We've got $5 billion, $5 billion in, um, in um, a scalable, a targeted measure which won't do anything terrible like pink bats and that's going to be a response to that's going to be a response to the pandemic and so that five billion turned into 50 billion and turned into 200 billion i i think the statements the government makes yeah i think it did i hope this will be true also for example of not being in the business of owning an airline they are uh, statements they make as a wishful thinking which the realities of the situation uh, Will for, have forced them in many respects to abandon, and I hope that will continue. So I think, I think, uh, at this stage, I'm, I am not drawing up detailed plans myself. I am looking at a bunch of issues to campaign on and seeing how we how we go. Yeah, well, just very quickly, the ruling class is drawing up a detailed mm. plan, which will be very flexible. It's integrated, and it's intended to make the ninety percent pay for the benefit of the ten percent. And it is it has new features, including what it wants to do with manufacturing, as well as some classical neoliberal features like further crushing workers' rights and so on. Uh, so I think we do need an alternative plan. And the only one that I've seen coming from a big organisation is the one that the UWU has produced. And it is open to being improved and it can be adapted as the circumstances provide for it. So I think uh, I'm a bit disappointed that you're not on top of that. And uh, I know we can't, all of us individuals do everything that we need to do, but I think we need to deepen the discussion and strengthen the quality as well as the volume of people who are switching on to it. Thanks, Luke. No worries, I'll take that as a, as a comment. Um, and uh, I'll ask, um, trying to get you here for the next question out. Uh, sorry, Roger, I'm just trying to find Roger Sharp on my, my list. I'll give you a second. Um, Roger's got a question about um, uh, renewables uh, going, um, and I might have to ask it myself if I can't find you, Roger. I'm sorry about that. Um, but the, the question, I don't, there you are, found you. So you can shoot yourself, Rog. Oh, okay. Um, hang on. I'm unmuted. Sorry. I just typed that I'm tired and headachy and don't know if I can answer it clearly, but I'll just read out what I wrote. So, Ren, um, re-renewables sort of ongoingly post the crisis. The question is, can the um, growth in the market economy 
carry through the spending in this kind of Keynesian way you were talking about before for the retooling of renewables and climate response. Um, my premise behind the question is that I suspect that the, the shrinking of the market economy, that the market economy will shrink despite all the spending on new in infrastructure for climate change with the writing off of huge amounts of fossil fuel based capital and activity. Um, I guess the short question is, will we need to manage degrowth and we need a post Keynesian response to, to really get climate? So there's a, a lot of a lot of issues wrapped up there. Yeah. So I think it's it's um, I mean it's important to recognise that um, uh, that the contraction, the likely contraction in the economy, uh, uh, is uh, big in terms of normal normal changes, but not big in terms of of the way that the market economy has typically grown. Which so the IMF is predicting six percent. That's roughly two or three years of, of normal economic growth. Uh, encouragingly, for the point of view of um, of, of renewables, uh, a lot of that is heavily concentrated in air travel, uh, uh, vehicle travel more generally, and a significant drop off in electricity demand, which globally is having a huge impact already on, well, of course, we've seen the price of oil go negative, uh, but the price of coal has fallen by almost 50%. Uh, Sweden and Austria, two countries in a week, just closed their final coal fire power stations. Uh, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing, I think, um, that people who are just hanging on and giving up, the banks are, are backing away globally from any kind of finance for coal. So I think, I think that um, uh, the scope for uh, uh, the scope for uh, uh, renewables is great. I don't think, I don't think at this stage we will see. A contraction across the board in economic activity, but we can certainly see, uh, certainly see what the Australian Conservation Foundation called better than growth, uh, getting away from things based on high levels of material throughput uh, towards uh, uh, towards more renewable energy and um, uh, towards a situation where I, I, a point I haven't mentioned so far, but uh, is. Uh, an important demand that we should be pushing coming out of this is, is reductions in working hours. Uh, that's been a standard response in these issues. We're going to have significant problems with employment for some time to come. And this is something which I think the labour movement's neglected. Uh, that means, of course, uh, typically a reduction in total consumption and therefore in energy consumption. But I think we're very well placed, uh, very well placed for, a, um, uh, for an increase in, um, a big increase in renewables. Uh, if the crisis persists, uh, I think we'll see the shutdown of a lot of the worst oil producing capacity, which will then be hard to hard to re reproduce, uh, so that when transport demand does recover, uh, there'll be a great deal more room for electrified transport of all kinds. So, so this is one of the things where I think uh, just just the physical logic of what's happening, uh, combined with the uh, overwhelming superiority of renewables uh, for the future, uh, we only see, see, I think, positive things coming out of this crisis. Thank you for that. Um, I've got a, a question now from uh, Tony Webb. Um, coming out of, oh, sorry, Jack Humphreys, I have one next. Uh, if Jack, you can ask your question, I'll go on to Tony after that. Yes, uh, thanks, John. I was just wondering, it follows on from Brian Sutherland's question. Uh, Australia reconstructed 1987 was an attempt to um, get industry planning, particularly in the manufacturing industry. And I was, uh, my question is, is that very relevant now to revisit what was in that document? And there's industries like the arts industry with mm. their great level of uh, uh, casual employment that haven't fitted into job uh, keepers, certainly. And the fact that um, I think 600,000 people are employed in the arts industry mm. overall. Uh, uh, do we need an industry plan, an economic plan in specific industry sectors to look after those uh, sectors, particularly the arts industry, mm. that are often uh, marginalised? Yes. Well, I mean, we do. And I was actually encouraged to see in The Guardian today uh, the Federal Minister Fletcher saying, yes, we're looking out for the arts industry, which, I mean, I didn't. I don't know how effective the details are, but at least in this respect, and unlike their response to universities, uh, it appears that they're overcoming the traditional "let's bash those arty farty guys" and uh, and support um, uh, support the people, uh, the good hardworking people who love us. So I think we are 
I think, yeah, we are seeing signs of progress that um, uh, that even this government is recognising that uh, the arts industry is a big employer, something which um, an area which uh, is very labour intensive and therefore needs to be supported. And I suppose that's the that's I think um, uh, the big change that's happened in the thirty odd years I guess since Australia reconstructed is that uh, the labour intensity of large scale manufacturing. Um, uh, things like motor vehicles and so forth has declined to the point where uh, where global employment in manufacturing is actually declining. So I don't think I don't think sort of nostalgia for the uh, the big factory based employment of the of the eighties is a, is a feasible approach. On the other hand, uh, what we've seen I think is um, uh, is the importance of maintaining a lot more capacity to do things uh, uh, and in a flexible way uh, across a whole range of of goods and services uh, than we had before, and that in turn, I think, set, cuts it uh, cuts in favour of a message of saying, let's forget about all this talk of efficiency, reform, co competition, and so forth, and concentrate on having an economy that actually works, both in good times and bad. What we've had, I think, is uh, a, in many ways a set of activities that were largely parasitic on the economic success of the post-war boom, uh, where you could assume that everything worked smoothly. Uh, when that ran into trouble, they said, well, we don't need this and we don't need that. Every time there's been a crisis, uh, it's turned out the state really is needed after all. And every time they've said, well, I thank God that's over, let's go back to doing things in the post-1980s post normal, I think, uh, I think that's changed. So I think we will need specific industry activity, specific industry strategies to coming out of this crisis uh, in the arts, in tourism because we're going to need to reorient the whole tourist industry from international to domestic tourism that's going to be a major major task in um, in reorganizing all sorts of supply chains in finding new markets to replace those in, in economies that don't make it successfully out of this crisis and i think the u.s economy is a prime a prime candidate for for failing very badly uh, that's that's going to have a whole series of knock-on effects. Uh, so I think we're going to need to see the kind of thinking behind Australia Reconstructed saying the government can't just let this stuff happen and hope for the best. Um, we have to have industry-specific uh, policies uh, for a long time to come. And that in turn reinforces the fact that full employment is the government's responsibility. Uh, we can't leave the markets. We certainly can't expect financial markets to deliver it. Thank you for that. And while I did say I was going to Tony, sorry, Tony, I'm operating a progressive speaking list. So uh, I've got a question from Anne Pico next. Anne? Thank you. Um, thank you, John. Um, this has been a really interesting discussion. But one of the things I'd actually like to raise, which hasn't been mentioned to date, is housing. It seems mm. to me that the COVID-19 crisis has really exposed some really terrible fissures in, in Australian society and an inequality that we were well aware of, but nowhere, it seems to me, more than in housing, where the sort of the various kind of band-aids they've tried to put on the whole situation of renters is one side of it, but the other side of it is the fact that they've done, as far as I can work out, zilch to look after the actual homeless, um, even though not housing them is actually a, mm. a threat to dealing with the, the health crisis itself. So I'd like you to, to talk about, if you wouldn't mind, um, how we can invest in social housing, which might start to make a real difference to housing people who are presently homeless or in precarious housing, and how that would how that would impact on bringing the price of housing down for people. Thank you. Sure. So I suppose yeah, you know, I'll mention yeah. You know, although this isn't this isn't at that end of the market, the one element of that 1980s agenda that hasn't been done and I actually support is. Uh, replacing stamp duty with land tax, with land tax, and using land tax uh, as a major means of financing public activity, and that would um, that would of course require sacrifice from uh, those of us who own homes, who own houses, uh, but uh, uh, would be greatly beneficial to uh, to everybody who doesn't. Uh, at the moment, those costs are loaded onto landlords uh, because privately owned has it, privately owned homes. So. Owner occupied homes are exempt from land tax, whereas uh, whereas uh, rental isn't. And indeed, uh, because there are uh, caps on that, uh, particularly the development of any kind of large scale rental housing in Australia has been crippled 
uh, by that by that tax regime that um, uh, that encourages first owner occupied housing and second so called mum and dad uh, rentals uh, strongly against um, strongly against either both social housing and uh, and large scale apartment housing of the kind rental apartment housing of the kind that is common in places like Europe. So that's one part of the story. I think a point you, you mentioned, and we're seeing this all around the world, is uh, a, you know, something which if it you know, was a standard theme for reformers in the 19th century, that poverty breeds disease and that you can't keep disease confined to the poor. And that I think is, uh, that I think was a big push of the, a big push uh, and needs to be, need, we need to be reminded of it, of course, for a long period, uh, antibiotics and vaccines did the job, uh, but um, uh, as as the world has globalised, uh, that's that's become you know, poor people anywhere uh, have, you know, are exposed to these diseases. They then pass them on to their wealthy neighbours, who then fly around the world to to carry it everywhere, and 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 that's happened with a string of these diseases uh, starting in all sorts of places, and we're seeing. In places like Singapore, which you know, looks gleaming at first glance, but you only have to stay there a little while to see you know, trucks full of people driving unsafe, you know, being driven around unsafely because, of course, they're expendable migrant workers, not Singaporeans. Uh, that's been that's been uh, a major factor in the resurgence of the disease within Singapore after initial, initially uh, suppressing it. We're seeing it in prisons in the US, in all sorts of, and of course, among the homeless. So I think it's an important demand. I'm, I'm not as on top of social housing as I should be, but I think again, when we look at the list of reforms that have have served us poorly, uh, getting rid of social housing is is, is one among them. Uh, the more uh, the more private rental we have, the more complicated the uh, attempt to say, well, landlord, yeah, tenants can't be evicted. Well, what about the landlords who are only individuals with mortgages, what should they do? So we have to go to the bank and, and sort this out. So I think all of these all of these things illustrate the point that virtually all the reform of the last 30 years has set us up to be the worst place to deal with COVID, not better. I think we've got time for one last quick question from Tony, then I'll start making my uh, thank yous. I've just posted in the chat some action components, including um, liking uh, John's public Facebook page. I've put a link there and signing up for uh, johnquiggan.com email updates. Also liking the page for his latest book, to uh, Economics in Two Lessons, and I've got a link there to buy the book on Booktopia, and of course also plug the Like the Search Facebook page, and uh, this will be um, uh, posted up on the Search YouTube channel, where you'll also find last week's one with uh, Sharon Burrow, our previous briefing with Paul Adler on his book on uh, democratic socialism. Uh, and the 99% economy, and the uh, one we had with Thomas Mayor, and ones we'll have in the future, which include uh, Sean Sweeney talking next week. Uh, Sean live from New York on um, from the Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. So I'll flip to Tony to get a quick question in, and uh, then we'll start wrapping up. Thanks, Luke. Uh, John, uh, this is an invitation to you to actually talk to us about what you think of that idea of the Tobin or Robin Hood tax. Mm. And the context is we've got an analysis within the industrial super funds that looks at the way in which they are forced at the moment to play in this area of financial speculation in order to get the returns for their members. But they know that in doing that, money is not going into what we're desperately going to need the other side of this crisis, which is a massive investment in the technological changes we need to have a sustainable economy. And they know that not having that money going into the productive wealth creating side uh, is also meaning that they don't have members with jobs who can have put their money into super in the first place. So as part of our looking at what we do the other side of this and, and getting a more progressive taxation system, what's your thought on the idea of putting that tax on all financially speculative measures within the, uh, that actually mean that we're getting money diverted from real wealth creation? Yeah, now I've been an advocate of a Tobin tax for, I guess, uh, four years, I guess, I think, certainly, certainly pretty much ever since Tobin put it forward, which would be 30 years or so ago. I think it's important to recognise 
that the primary objective of the tax is, as with taxes on tobacco and smoking, is not to raise revenue, but to reduce the activity that we're, uh, mm. reduce the volume of the activity that we're seeing. And, and so um, even a small token tax would greatly reduce the volume of financial transactions. I've argued consistently that uh, those, the, the huge volume of financial transactions, uh, which was growing exponentially until the, the global financial crisis has leveled off a bit since then, but is still gigantic. Virtually all of that is devoted either to uh, dodging tax or to what, what's called regulated arbitrage, essentially uh, taking risks in ways that um, uh, are not covered by regulations uh, in the expectation if something goes wrong, you can bind a government to bail you out. So, so I think as part of the response to the global financial crisis, um, uh, we need to, uh, uh, this was long overdue as a response. Uh, I think an important part of this crisis is that the financial markets were missing in action. So they're supposed to, of course, uh, be uh, huge adding machines that compute and cal calculate all the information that comes in from vast amounts of sources, uh, give us accurate information. Uh, the US government and lots of governments were getting information about the pandemic uh, as uh, you know, in January, uh, US stock markets reached their all time high in late February, about the time that the average punter reading the Daily Telegraph was starting to think there might be something wrong here. And of course, uh, financial market products have been entirely useless or almost entirely useless as a response to the crisis, mm -hmm. it's all been done by government. So that leads to the conclusion uh, that we really don't need these large financial institutions at all. We, uh, we certainly need retirement savings through, through, some, through, some, through uh, some kind of super and we need, uh, uh, we need the kind of banks that ordinary people go to and the businesses go to for finance. Uh, we really don't need uh, any of the set of uh, futures markets, uh, derivatives and so forth, which uh, uh, produced a disaster 10 years ago and have done us no good whatsoever this time around. And a, a token tax would help to greatly reduce the volume of those transactions, make all sorts of, of high volume transactions infeasible, and therefore reduce the waste of real resources. Uh, highly skilled people working very hard to corner angles on this stuff those people would be forced to go and do something that's actually useful. Thank you. And thank you, Tony. Well, we're at uh, 4.02 and we promised to finish on time. John's a very busy man. Um, so I don't want to uh, delay him any further. Really want to thank you, John, for, for being there um, and you know answering those questions um, one after the other in quick succession so well. Uh, and of course, for your, your first presentation too. Um, it's been wonderful. We've got, it seems like every question uh, sparks another 10 questions. So all the people who uh, didn't get on to ask a question directly, I encourage you to, um, as I said, uh, go over to johnquiggin.com, participate in, in the discussion there. Um, we are very lucky to have someone of John's uh, profile and um, uh, research uh, fame, as it were, um, democratising knowledge as you are. Uh, and making that available to so many of us uh, online today. Thank you very, very much for being there. Thank you to all our questioners uh, and thanks for um, uh, participating uh, online. All those who couldn't ask a question, as I said, please go to uh, johnquiggin.com, uh, like the Search Facebook page, get involved uh, in those um, uh, through, the, the, through our, our next uh, series of um, uh, Zoom briefings. So we've got uh, Sean Sweeney next week and, um, now, uh, our uh, playing of the Internationale reggae version was very <laughs> uh, at the end of our Sharon Burrow video. So I'm now going to uh, let you all go, but um, we'll leave to the, uh, the uh, socialism train by the Ethiopians, another reggae classic. Okay, well, thanks everybody. It was really great. Thanks, Millie and John.
Everybody needs work. And it's more shot at my 